right, everyone, it's 3.30. I'm going to mute myself and then hit broadcast. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us. We are thrilled to be presenting this timely panel, Hot Topics in Free Speech and Free Press, sponsored by the ABA Section of Civil Rights and Social Justice, Free Speech and Free Press Committee. Um, this is the latest in a series of these panels we've been doing about twice a year for several years now in which we explore current controversies over free speech and free press. Um, the section is also actively planning other programs on lots of other topics and other issues. If you are interested and have the chance, please visit AmericanBar.org slash CRSJ and look for updates on these many programs. Um, in today's program, we will encourage you to ask questions of the panelists, but we ask you to do that using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screens, not the chat room and not the raise hand function. Um, if you're not familiar with it at the bottom of your screens, if you click down there as a toolbar and you will see the Q&A function and you can enter your questions um, we are going to talk uh, with the panelists for a, a chunk of time and present a number of issues. Um, and then uh, uh, either when we run out of steam uh, or at 4.30, whichever comes first, uh, we will turn to the questions in the Q&A room and try to answer as many of them as we can. Um, there is a feature in the Q&A function so that if you see questions being posed by people, uh, you can vote for those questions if you like them. And those questions will then move up in the list uh, because uh, uh, presumably there will be more than we have time to answer. Uh, and we'll try to take the ones that are at the top of the list. So thank you in advance for posing your questions. Um, we are also uh, recording this and we'll be sharing a recording of the program with everyone who's registered so that you can share it with your own networks when we're finished. Um, so with that, let me introduce our panelists for Hot Topics in Free Speech and Free Press. Uh, first of all, I'm Steve Wormiel. I'm a professor at American University Washington College of Law. Um, I teach First Amendment and constitutional law, and I'm co-chair of the committee of the civil rights section that's bringing you this panel. I am very honored to be joined by a distinguished panel um, featuring uh, Bob Corn Revere, uh, a lawyer with the firm of Davis Wright Tremaine and one of the leading First Amendment litigators in the United States today. Lucy Dalglish, who's the Dean of the Philip Merrill College of Journalism at the University of Maryland, uh, and also a lawyer and former director of the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press, um, and Lada Knott, who's an attorney, author, and fellow at the Freedom Forum Institute, and longtime First Amendment expert and advocate as well. Um, and with that, let's get right into it. Um, Lada, will you start us off by talking about uh, stay-at-home laws, protests against stay-at-home laws, and, and what the First Amendment has to say about all of this? Absolutely. Um, it's a question that uh, I've been getting, and I'm sure that everyone on this panel has been getting in the last few weeks, as to whether the stay-at-home orders are violations of First Amendment rights. Um, you know, that's been the rhetoric at a lot of the anti-quarantine protests, that this is First Amendment rights being trampled on. Um, but our answer to the question, which has been disappointing for some people, is that for the most part, most of these laws are constitutional um, because uh, the Tenth Amendment grants states, governors, and, uh, and mayors the power to pass laws that protect the public health and preserve public safety. But of course, just because they have the authority to pass these laws, it doesn't automatically make them constitutional. What we look at is um, a strict scrutiny analysis, whether there's a compelling purpose behind these orders and whether this is the least restrictive means of achieving that purpose. 
Uh, and here, obviously, the compelling purpose is stopping the pandemic from spreading. For the most part, like most of the orders that we've seen are the least restrictive means, like you know, limiting the size of public gatherings, not limiting gathering altogether. Um, it's interesting that we've seen some, some situations like in uh, Greenville, Mississippi, there was a case where a pastor was holding drive-in services for his congregation um, and you know people were penalized for it. And at this point, it's, um, I don't think the case has been heard yet, but the Justice Department actually submitted a statement in support of the pastor. Um, and I think that that just kind of shows that with that particular order, like there's a, there's a question of whether banning a drive-in service is really, is it really necessary in order to stop the spread of the pandemic? And, you know, when the anti-quarantine protests started up across the country, it's interesting because the first question was like, well, if you participate in such a protest, are you breaking the law? Um, there are some states, like for instance, Arizona, that have an exemption in their stay-at-home orders for First Amendment activities. So as long as they're conducted in a manner that's conducive to social distancing. Uh, you know, if you look at photographs of the protests, query whether those social distancing standards were actually adhered to, but you know, it is it is part of the law that yes, protest is an essential activity as long as it's, and it, it's permitted as long as it's performed um, in a way that doesn't promote the spread of the virus. But with states that don't have an exemption like that, there's been a question as to whether it's the protesters who are violating the law or um, practicing civil disobedience depending on how you look at it, or whether it's the state that's violating the constitution by, um, by not allowing this first amendment activity to take place. And Floyd Abrams wrote an op-ed uh, just a couple of days ago um, saying that a lot of states are actually running afoul of the first amendment because they're maintaining a blanket ban on protests, uh, which just isn't narrowly tailored enough to pass strict scrutiny. And his example, or well, one of his examples was California, where um, they banned all protests at state facilities. A federal judge recently upheld the ban, saying that California's got a legitimate interest in limiting person-to-person -person interactions. But you know, Floyd Abrams actually disagreed with this uh, and asked if the blanket ban is in fact the least restrictive means of preserving the public health. I mean, you could permit protests with social distancing guidelines or and require masks. You could limit the number of protesters who can assemble. I mean, that's his argument. And I think it's still an open question, what's permissible and what isn't. But there is an argument to be made that if we want to treat First Amendment rights like essential activities, that doesn't necessarily mean that anything goes. But it, in a sense, you know, grocery shopping is essential. Grocery stores are open, but stores have taken measures uh, to preserve public health to only let a certain number of people in at the same time, require they wear masks. And so I think when it comes to protests, there's a lot of room between cutting off the activity altogether and allowing business as usual and mass gatherings to proceed unchecked. Any questions or comments from other panelists, different perspectives? Well, I, I think it is interesting. Two things are interesting about it. One is I think there is uh, uh, room for uh, agreement or disagreement about how extensively those restrictions are applied. I think everybody agrees that when you have emergency situations, governments are seated greater power. There's more of a compelling interest. And yet the question becomes how those powers are exercised. So for example, another of the examples that uh, Floyd Abrams mentions in his op-ed pieces in North Carolina, where police dispersed a protest saying that this activity was non-essential. Um, and so Again, it's, it's an area where you do see more activity uh, and the question is how it's, how it's exercised. The other thing that I find interesting just from reading the various um, news stories about the protests is that you see an extension of the polarization of our politics in both how the, uh, the protests are, are happening and how they're, how they're described by commentators, whether they're uh, describing these as politically tinged in one direction or another. And uh, so I, I find that a little bit sad in a way, but also uh, I expect it's not unexpected. Lada, I was, I was curious as I was listening to you, I mean, we haven't had a situation like this, well, in a hundred years, yeah. but the case law that the various states are relying on, uh, and the federal circuits 
when did most of those cases we're going to be relying on? When, when did they come up? Uh, I believe they came Are up they? in the early 1900s. Yeah. So, so we're relying on, on, on case law that's really pretty old. And I, I think it's, um, I, I, I find the whole discussion fascinating. And going back to my uh, case books, uh, <laughs> trying to figure out which, which one applies to that one right now, because this doesn't happen very often. That is true. Well, interesting, Bob, Bob, you've been writing a lot of history, but the case law that gives the emergency powers to the states and local governments predates any real teeth in the First Amendment. That's true. And, and the thing that's really, I think, most interesting about this, maybe not most interesting, given how unique the, cir the circumstance is, uh, is that it's really hard to enforce any kinds of restrictions without showing some kind of discrimination that will get you into trouble with other First Amendment principles. And so, you know, uh, as Lada said, you know, grocery shopping is an essential service, but is going to church essential? Um, same thing with the protests, uh, where you have uh, the state police in North Carolina breaking up uh, a protest saying this is non-essential. So I think whether or not you agree with the general principle of this is an, that this is an area of expanded government power where courts are going to be more forgiving, uh, it's really in the as applied space where this is going to have, I think, uh, really immediate constitutional problems. In the last 24 hours, I think the most interesting story I saw about this came from my former home state of Minnesota, where the archbishop and the Lutherans basically are, are openly defying the governor's order about whether or not they can hold mass or services. And this is Minnesota. People tend to be relatively, they don't like to draw attention to themselves all that much. Um, I just, I'll note two things. Um, my, my good friend at the ABA and former journalism colleague, Bill Choik notes in the Q&A that abalegalfactcheck.com has some information about the background on the case law um, and suggests that, that people can look there if they're interested. Um, Bob, you mentioned the polarization and politics of this and Lada, I don't wanna get you in trouble but um, I presume that the right to protest, whatever we think of it, probably didn't include the right to carry uh, automatic weapons into the Michigan State House. <laughs> That's uh, there's been a lot written about that, um, and whether you know whether that First Amendment right encompasses that Second Amendment right. Um, I, I would say that as written the right to protest, I mean, considering that it's the right to protest nonviolently, I, I suppose you can protest nonviolently even if you're armed, but I don't think that that's necessarily encompassed in that First Amendment right. All right, thank you. Um, Bob, let's, let's well, you, you wanna I, add something? Go ahead. Well, I was just gonna add that, that the First Amendment issues that have come up as a result of the pandemic, uh, really uh, pop, uh, pop up in a lot of different areas, uh, many of them that affect the press. So for example, the way in which freedom of information laws are being administered during the pandemic uh, is a, mm -hmm. a issue. Uh, also, it's just reported um, ACLU has challenged a law in Puerto Rico that had banned, quote, fake news. Just and that, uh, okay. you know, for example, there had been a pre-existing law since 2017 that had been targeting journalists. But, they readopted a provision just last month uh, that made it a crime to report let's see, false information about an order uh, declaring a state of emergency, disaster, or uh, curfew in order to cause confusion or panic. Uh, and, and so, you know, the First Amendment problems of prohibiting fake news are, are pretty obvious. It also comes up in other ways in which government programs are administered. So the PPP program, for example, uh, giving loans to small businesses mm -hmm. to allow people to continue pay, uh, paying the bills. The SBA had interpreted this to prohibit the ability to provide loans to businesses that featured performances of a prurient sexual nature. And so gentlemen's clubs uh, in um, 
Wisconsin and in Michigan challenge those provisions as being directly content-based. And at this point, the courts are, are upholding those challenges. And just two days ago, the Seventh Circuit, or maybe even just yesterday, the Seventh Circuit uh, denied a uh, government attempt to stay uh, the Wisconsin court's order saying that this uh, restriction on which businesses could get loans uh, was a violation of the First Amendment. So the, the number and variety of First Amendment issues that have come up as a result of the pandemic is uh, pretty significant. And there's also like a, so one of your earlier points about like whether um, churches are essential services, it's interesting, you're right, like there's it's kind of a First Amendment bonanza, there's just so much. <laughs> <laughs> but, whether, right? If you consider um, churches to be essential services, then there's a question of whether is that a violation of the establishment clause? Are you favoring a religious organization over a non-religious gathering? Interesting stuff. Yeah. All right. Um... Well, Thank I, you. It, it raises one other point, and you know, I think it, it um, bears mentioning just when you're contrasting it with uh, the approach towards strip clubs. The American Association of Political Consultants uh, had uh, challenged uh, the PPP restriction on uh, getting loans for organizations that provide lobbying services and political consulting. Mm -hmm. And there, uh, in uh, D.C. District Court, their bid for a TRO was denied. So I. Which is more of an essential service, strip clubs or lobbyists? I, you know, <laughs> the age-old question. Yeah, can't live without either. No, just kidding. Um, all right, a lot of thanks for getting us started, um, Bob. The uh, the lawsuit that you are deeply involved in, in behalf of Penn America, I think was uh, uh, of timely and and, and significant uh, importance. Uh, before we uh, got into the COVID-19 crisis and began to see even a, a, a step up, if it's possible, in media bashing uh, at, the, at the top of the administration. Uh, but tell us where that stands and how it's unfolding. Uh, well, thanks for asking. There has been some movement in it. Just to recap a little bit, this is a lawsuit brought by PEN America against President Trump to... Um, uh, seek a declaratory ruling that his actions to both retaliate against and threaten members of the press uh, violates the First Amendment. Uh, it was, as I say, brought on behalf of PEN America, which is an organization that uh, protects writers, artists, and journalists. Um, it was uh, brought by the uh, Protect Democracy Project and the Media Freedom and uh, uh, Access Clinic at Floyd, the Floyd Abrams Clinic at uh, uh, Yale University. And then um, a, a team of lawyers that I'm part of in Davis Wright Tremaine were invited to become part of that case. Uh, it had been filed originally in the fall of 2018 um, and then an amended complaint filed in um, February, I believe of uh, 2019. And there it sat, uh, the administration filed a motion to dismiss the action claiming that PEN America didn't have standing to raise these challenges. And um, it was fully briefed and waiting for a decision. And then finally, there were some other cases that had some relevance to it in uh, the Second Circuit that got decided. And then just uh, this past February, Judge Schofield denied uh, the government's motion to dismiss the claim uh, for two important claims. One, that efforts to retaliate against the press or threaten the press, uh, members of the, the White House Press Corps by denying press credentials and also efforts to remove um, security clearances for critics of the administration mm -hmm. um, were uh, those claims that are allowed to go forward. Mm -hmm. So at this point, the case would normally go into discovery. Uh, and uh, the question is <laughs> whether that's going to happen. Um, Judge Schofield asked the parties could stipulate to the facts so that she could then rule on the legal issues. Uh, that had been done in the case brought by the, uh, the Knight First Amendment Foundation uh, it, attacking uh, President Trump's um, silencing of critics on Twitter um, and, and uh, um, stipulating facts didn't work out so well for the administration in that case. Uh, and so they've decided not to uh, stipulate facts in this one. And now it looks like the administration is going to seek an interlocutory appeal, and that is to sort of seek certification that the case involves close and difficult questions which courts could disagree on uh, 
and to seek an appeal rather than to submit to discovery uh, right away. So we'll see how that goes, but at least there's been some movement in the case and gratifying that Judge Schofield uh, denied the motion to dismiss the claims. Does the government have any kind of privilege claims here? This is not the same. <laughs> yeah, you, I think it's safe to anticipate that uh, when we do get into discovery, uh, that the White House will be claiming uh, privilege for its practices toward the press. Uh, and is there any precedent for that or unclear? <laughs> um, well, I, for some reason, the name Richard Nixon comes to mind. <laughs> <laughs> So, yes. All right, and any sense of the timing for next moves? Uh, hard to say at this point. Uh, this case has been uh, difficult to anticipate timing uh, from the beginning. As I say, after it was briefed on the motion to dismiss, um, it was ready for a decision for uh, um, quite a few months. Uh, so, you know, it's really hard to say. The question is whether or not uh, more will happen before the, the November election. Yeah. Um, I, I guess I can't, I can only speak for myself, but I certainly have watched more interaction between the White House and the media in the last two months than I had probably in the last, in the preceding three years. Um, is there, a, is there any effort to supplement the complaint with some of the conduct that we've observed in the president's COVID-19 briefings? Not at this point. I mean, it's not like there's a lack of examples. Uh, and so, um, you know, at some point, uh, if we get to summary judgment, uh, I'm certain there will be uh, uh, an effort and an opportunity to supplement the record. Um, you know, whether or not specific facts are alleged in the complaint, if there are further examples that come to light and are part of the public record um, before the court is called to rule on it, they, they can certainly become part of the case. Uh, I'm curious, which examples did you rely on in the complaint? Of, uh... keep, keep in mind that um, uh, this was originally filed in the fall of 2018, and then mm -hmm. the uh, complaint or the amended complaint was, was filed in uh, February of the following year. Uh, at the time, the prime example was Jim Acosta from CNN, uh, right. uh, White House press branch had taken. Uh, at the time that we filed the amended complaint, John Brennan, former director of the CIA, mm -hmm. had his security uh, clearance stripped. There were other claims in the complaint that uh, were not allowed to go forward. So for example, some other examples were the president's directing uh, the Postal Service to re review and increase postal rates as a retaliatory act toward Amazon because Jeff Bezos owning the Washington Post was one of the uh, issues that was raised initially. Also the notion of threatening uh, broadcast networks and their licenses um, over uh, unfavorable coverage. Um, the uh, at and Time Warner merger, uh, which was another target of uh, Trump's uh, retaliatory uh, tweets. Uh, those were examples that were not part of the case that is going forward, but those instances of removing press credentials for uh, reporters who were critical of, of the president, as well as stripping security clearances were the examples that were um, named, named at the time. Now, right. Years ago, I would not have thought of a case lumping in Jim Acosta, Brennan, the post office, and you know the rest of them, it just would have seemed un unfathomable. Well, it's, it's kind of kind of like uh, uh, lattice out of the uh, uh, the pandemic, sort of a cornucopia of, of First Amendment. <laughs> that's right. um, but that's what's going on with this White House as well. All right, thanks, Bob. Um, Lucy, you you we've talked a little bit, you and I, about. Uh, the, I guess for lack of a better term, crisis in, uh, in local news organizations, the advertising problems, the, the financial situations and what long-term impact the COVID-19 crisis may have on local news. Yeah, uh, I, I, you know, this is a, 
fascinating time to be in the news media business, and it's also a terrifying team time to be in the in the business. And the past eight weeks have been surreal for many reasons. I mean, we're at home working from our dining room tables, and we're wondering how to supervise people from you know you haven't seen in weeks. But as uh, Ken Paulson from Middle Tennessee State University says, as part of the COVID survival guide, you need to wash your hands, wear a mask, and subscribe to your local newspaper. <laughs> right. um, and I think it's really ironic that during this time of international crisis, people have never been more interested in or in need of news, whether that's local, state, federal, or international news. But I think as most of our um, participants today realize that we, we've lost thousands of local newspapers over the last 15 years. And when the pandemic is over, uh, I, I worry that local news will be almost gone. And when I talk about local news, I'm talking about um, the, the folks that, you know, covered the news when you were a kid, the folks in, you know, Dubuque and uh, Mankato and Towns like that, that's where the crisis is really, really apparent. Some local newspapers are reporting that they lost 40 to 60% of their expected revenue in one month in March. And you can obviously tell when you pick up your local paper, if you still get it on paper, or if you log in um, to your favorite website, it's lighter, you know, it's, it's skinnier, it's lighter. Uh, there's just not as much in it. There's still ample information about the COVID crisis, but um, you know, even the Post, the Times, and the Wall Street Journal are, are pretty slim these days. So obviously when you have a local paper, you know what your mayor and city council are, are doing to address the emergency. You know what businesses are open or closed. You know whether or not your kid's education is going to continue. Uh, or whether or not your town has coronavirus testing sites. Um, so like I said, the shrinkage is mostly in local newspapers. Today, as I was um, polishing up my notes, I found a Pointer Institute report that was released today that said last week alone, 25 news weeklies across the country closed. And I, four or five of those were in Southern Minnesota uh, it was uh, really, really alarming. So local television is hanging in there, but television has never provided the depth of local news. And TV is, you know, because of, of the nature of TV is, is largely focused on the larger cities. So they're doing okay for the time being, but there's a frightening statistic that has news directors around the country kind of alarmed. Tom Rosenstiel at the American Press Institute um, released a report about a year ago that said that those under the age of about 35 have no relationship with local television news. They didn't really grow up watching it. They're not watching it now. And they're doing what the kids in my college do to get their information. They're walking around like this, you know, playing on, on their phone to get their news. So a decline, according to Penny Abernathy from the University of North Carolina <laughs> School, a decline in local news availability usually signals several things. Number one, it means the local economy is in trouble. Number two, it usually means there's lower voter turnout. Number three, there's usually more political polarization. And four, interestingly enough, your taxes are likely to go up because there's nobody keeping an eye on your local lawmakers. So why is the discussion of the economic decline of the news media important to a discussion about the First Amendment? Well, first and foremost, what I always think about, and if you're a First Amendment and government transparency historian, you recognize a few of these truths. Over the past 60 years, Local newspapers fought and paid for most of the litigation that defended libel suits brought by public officials and others trying to shut down opposition through slap-like lawsuits. Uh, it was the newspapers that lobbied for state, local, and federal open meetings and open records laws. In fact, the Federal Freedom of Information Act would not have been signed by LBJ in 1966 if it were not for the American Society of Newspaper Editors. <laughs> 
Uh, we can think back to those classic cases we all studied um, where newspapers litigated for access to courts. Think of Nebraska Press Association versus Stewart in 1976, the Richmond Newspapers versus Virginia case in 1980, the uh, Press Enterprise case that's in the 1980s. I mean, there's it was those local newspaper publishers that fought for those rights. And it was pretty much all about government transparency. And newspapers have always um, taken the laboring oar when it comes to um, the fight to protect confidential sources. Television, magazines, book publishers, they were all involved, but most of the cases and the laws that developed were developed on the back of those local newspaper publishers. So who's going to take their place? Well, my old organization, um, the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press is doing very well. They're very, very busy. They've been very successful raising philanthropic dollars to fight battles all over the country, but they can't do everything. Um, they're just not geared up for it. And you have to have somebody locally to tell you that there's a problem. And if those people, you know, a lot of those somebodies have disappeared. So, um, you know, can we move to the digital world and move on to, um, uh, you know, the, the vices and the buzz feeds of the world? Well, I, I don't think we can, um, because at about the same time that the news about COVID-19 was being thoroughly covered by virtually everybody, last week, upstart digital pub publications like Vice laid off 155 employees, Quartz laid off 80 Condé Nast laid off 100, and BuzzFeed announced furloughs for everybody. So whatever advertising revenue that accompanies those local stories that you do read, you probably got to them through either Facebook, somebody sent it to you, or Google. And um, the revenue from that advertising is not going to the content creators. Rather, the revenue is going largely to Facebook and Google. And thus far, those tech companies have shown little to no interest in the public's right to know. Facebook, to its credit, has announced a $36 million investment in local news initiatives that pales in comparison to the Knight Foundation, $100 million. So um, philanthropy is not going to be enough. There, are, There's talk of a variety of um, uh, business models that might be able to, um, we might be able to talk about in a little bit, but I'm really worried for the Republic when voters have no reliable way to get accurate, timely information about matters that are very important in their communities. Thank you, Lucia. The numbers are, are terrifying. Um, Bob or Lada, any thoughts, comments? Well, actually, this reminds me of like a couple of years ago, a study that I think was done by the Brookings Institute about um, in towns that had lost uh, two newspapers like in the previous decade, uh, they had higher municipal bond rates. Um, kind of showing the point that when no one was watching, um, you know, you, you actually had economic problems like the, due to corruption just because even if people don't read local news, it's important that somebody is actually reporting and watching like local government. Um, and just a question for Lucy, do you think that um, nonprofit news is a, is a business model that we'll see more of? Do you think that I think we are going to see more nonprofits. I mean, just in the last five years or so, if they've gone from, or maybe 10 years, they've gone from maybe a dozen across the country to hundreds. The independent news network has hundreds of members. You're going to see more collaborations like we have with um, the Philip Merrill College of Journalism, and we, we have some with the Associated Press and with NPR and the News Hour, where students are working um, to help provide content. So philanthropy is um, having some really pretty big successes, but if I think if you're a news publisher, um, you're also looking at uh, other things that you can't rely on philanthropy entirely. Probably you're going to have to look at, you know, this is a boring, would have been a boring to me 10 years ago, government subsidies, uh, tax breaks, um, other regulations on the tech companies, um, you know, man, taxes on them for that would go funneled to the news organizations. Uh, I, I think we're in very, very interesting times. <laughs> 
Thank you, Lucy. Um, I have a few different items that I just want to kind of tick off and uh, uh, if any of my panelists want to chime in or comment on them, great. And if not, I'll keep moving through them and we'll work our way toward uh, Q and A. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is access to information. We've talked a little bit already about Freedom of Information Act. There have been some interesting COVID-19 related access developments, um, some of them local, some of them are more national. I mean, the more, I suppose the most obvious one, and I'll just, I'll throw it out as a question, is um, where's Dr. Fauci? <laughs> uh, and, and the answer is not home quarantining because he has access to, to Zoom and Skype and other ways of, of communicating uh, even from home quarantining. Uh, but it seems as though the White House has chosen to uh, no longer make him available. Um, I would presume, although we don't know for sure, because they don't like what he has to say anymore. Um, and that in itself should be concerning. Um, if the, the person who might have the greatest amount of credibility in this entire crisis is being silenced because what he has to say is contrary to the message that our leaders want us to hear. Um, that ought to raise free press access concerns, free speech concerns, and so on. Um, some more specific examples. Um, there is a flap going on in Florida that has been well covered by the Miami Herald and others. Uh, in which the, 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 there have been several phases of this. It started at the end of April when the state officials in Florida ordered the county medical examiners, the coroners, county by county, to stop releasing COVID-19 mm -hmm. fatality reports, um, seemingly because the state didn't like the numbers that were coming out of the coroner's offices. Um, that fight then morphed into a larger battle between the state and the entire, there's a, there's a trade group, if you will, there's an association of Florida medical examiners um, that, that objected to essentially having their numbers and their reports uh, be silenced by the state of Florida. Um, more recently this week, um, a woman named Rebecca Jones, who was the person running the um, Florida dashboard, the, the website for the state that had all of the current data about the COVID-19 virus in Florida, um, she was removed from her position running the dashboard. Again, the inference, and I have no independent knowledge here, I have to say, but the inference seems to be that state officials didn't like the fact that she was posting um, accurate information. The website started having technical problems, surprisingly, and, and going down, and then suddenly she was removed from her job. Uh, the Miami Herald and other organizations in Florida uh, filed a request with the state to get accurate information. They pressed the state for a couple of weeks and the state finally released what it said was a comprehensive list of all coronavirus, coronavirus fatalities. And the Miami Herald again and other news organizations went through that list and found dozens of flaws in it and missing information and missing names and so on. Um, I've seen some suggestion that it's, this is not unique to Florida. I saw one news story that suggested there were similar issues in Georgia um, and maybe in other states as well. So, so I'm not even sure what you call it, a sense by, by local state government officials that they want to manage the, the flow of information for their states for whatever reasons, um, I think raises some significant First Amendment concerns. Another item um, that uh, I encountered just today 
Um, it was a lawsuit against Fox News. And apparently the hearing on this was broadcast live on YouTube this morning. Um, uh, there is a, a lawsuit in Washington State Court um, by a local civic organization called the Washington League for Increased Transparency and Ethics. And they sued Fox News under a state consumer protection law because Fox News um, for weeks and weeks and even to some extent still has referred to the COVID-19 crisis as a hoax. And so they are trying to stop Fox from calling it a hoax, saying that that violates, um, for, for lack of a better description, that violates truth in consumer information state laws. It, it's um, a ridiculous case. Well, the relevance to us is, of course, that Fox has asserted a First Amendment defense and, and said that it has a right to refer to the crisis in any way it wants. Um, and that it's that it's reporting and descriptions are protected by the First Amendment. Right. And so what we see in the lawsuit is a group of activists claiming that Fox is fake news and they want to be able to bring a consumer protection action uh, to uh, force Fox to report the events the way they would like to see them. I've read some of the papers and it's interesting. They're arguing not just that uh, the reporting is wrong. They're arguing that cable news networks don't have the same First Amendment rights as even broadcasters. Uh, it mm -hmm. is a ridiculously uninformed um, legal argument. Uh, that I mean, The argument had always been that broadcasters have more attenuated First Amendment rights because they're licensed to use um, the electromagnetic spectrum, whereas other media, traditional media like newspapers have full First Amendment protection um, under the First Amendment. Um, and cable, at least since, well, 20 years ago, the Supreme Court confirmed that they have full First Amendment rights as well and not attenuated in the way that broadcast is. But this case goes further to say that unlike broadcasting and unlike newspapers, this is a cable network, uh, you know, they, they just don't have First Amendment rights. And it's, it's just ridiculous. So it's contrary to the law and trying to actually flip the, the state of the law. That, that's right. And it's trying to say that a consumer protection law uh, should be able to dictate how news can be characterized or reported. I haven't read the papers for this case, so just a question. How are they justifying, or what's their argument that cable news networks have more attenuated First Amendment rights than broadcasters? Well, they try and compare it to things like company towns because cable uses uh, public oh. rights and you know things like that. It's it's. It looks like something written by people who've never read a, a First Amendment case. Um, the, the judge in the Washington State lawsuit said he would issue a written opinion soon. Um, the hearing, as I said, was this morning. So stay tuned for that one. I think it'll be interesting to see what happens. Um, yeah, one I, more. I wanted to comment just on one other thing that you were talking about earlier, and that is the, the trend in limiting public information. And I think that when you think about that, juxtaposed against the trends uh, that Lucy was describing in what's happening to news organizations. Uh, the impulses that you describe of having governments try and control the flow of news, that's just the way governments are. That's mm -hmm. what they try and control uh, access to news. And particularly where you have an emergency situation like this, those impulses are going to be even stronger and probably a bit darker than they, they normally are because uh, that's exactly when governments would try to avoid accountability. And when you stack that up against the catastrophe that's happening with news, this is why news organizations exist, to try and get the information that governments are unwilling to provide. And so it's, it's a, a, a terrible confluence of events where you have the greatest need for that information and governments doing what governments do uh, juxtaposed against the news organizations being um, tottering on the brink as well. And uh, along that line, and I don't have all the details, some of you may know more of some of these th than I do, but I know there have been a number of Freedom of Information Act cases filed in the last few weeks uh, 
one I think is either filed or is about to be filed because the the government, this, the, the Small Business Administration is saying that they're not required to release any information about who's getting the uh, the, the loans that the, that the Congress has authorized. And I think there are other similar FOIA cases being filed by news organizations. Mm -hmm. uh, if anybody else has more details about those, I don't, but feel free to, to mention. Well, I don't have an exact, I'm, I'm not familiar with those, but I've been thinking over the last couple of days that there really is no, um, uh, this is the first time in my life I've seen such an ex uh, example of federalism and what it means when each state gets to come up with its own transparency laws. They each get to handle the statistics in the, the way they want to. And if you want to read something or look at something that's absolutely absurd. Uh, the Washington Post, David Farenthold today, tweeted a graphic, a data visualization from the state of um, Georgia, in which they were trying to show the trend in that their number of cases and deaths and everything in their various counties was declining. But what they did was they mixed up the dates. So at the right. bottom, they would have like April 30th and May 2nd, and then April 14th, and then you know May 6th, and then May 9th, and then May 8th. It, it's absolutely ridiculous because that's how they were able to show this decline. And uh, you know the the Florida examples. There is no greater example of why the public needs access to this basic information. I go to the website. I'm obsessed two, three times a day. I want to know in the, the DC, Virginia, Maryland area, what's the rates? Where can I go? I'm looking at it all the time. And then once a day in my family, my brother in Arizona tweets the Arizona numbers. My sister tweets the North Dakota numbers. My brother tweets the Massachusetts numbers. And we're looking at those numbers. Um, it's, it's vital information for public health. And the fact that somebody like Florida is messing around with this information is absolutely appalling. And then as you said earlier, and as Bob reinforced with, if you combine that with the demise of mm -hmm. local news organizations, um, you know, they, they, they sort of go hand in hand. There's no accountability. There's no accountability and who's going to be able to go in there and sue in all of the states. I suppose maybe the reporters committee, um, but that's pretty heavy lift that they shouldn't have to take on. All right, I just wanted to quickly mention um, one other area that's not specifically COVID related, but since we're here talking about first amendment, uh, we'll, we'll turn to Q and A in, in, in two or three minutes. I just wanted to note that there are still two free speech decisions to come from the Supreme Court this spring. Uh, interestingly, both of them were cases that were uh, part of the telephone conferencing arguments, um, which I, I mean, the court never told us that they picked the most important 10 cases out of about 25 that were pending for the telephone conferences, but I guess one presumes that they chose the ones that they felt had to get argued and couldn't wait till next term. So I just wanted to mention them briefly. Um, one is the Agency for International Development versus the Alliance for Open Society. Um, this is a replay with a variation in the facts of a case decided about seven years ago. Um, it, it has to do with funding that Congress has been providing for uh, really about two decades to combat uh, the spread of HIV and AIDS around the world um, by appropriating funds to organizations that were working to combat HIV and AIDS, um, both domestic and international organizations. Uh, Congress attached a condition to organizations that want to accept those funds that they have to take a stated 
uh, announced public position opposing prostitution and opposing sex trafficking. Um, the court in 2013 ruled by a vote of six to two with Justice Kagan recused um, that that condition as it applied to um, domestic, to United States nonprofits um, violated the First Amendment, that it was an unconstitutional condition being imposed on the free speech rights of US organizations that were doing this work overseas, but were based in the United States. This case is a sequel to that in which the government is still trying to enforce that requirement that you have to state your opposition to prostitution and sex trafficking um, to enforce that on international organizations that are receiving US funds. So the case already decided was domestic organizations. Now it's being enforced against international organizations. The different, and the, the, uh, the, the Justice Department lost in the court below. Um, uh, the Second Circuit struck down the application of the rule to international organizations. Uh, so it's the, it's the Justice Department appealing to the Supreme Court. The difference now is that the Justice Department says international organizations don't have any constitutional rights and therefore don't have any First Amendment rights and therefore this can't be an unconstitutional condition. Um, so it makes it somewhat different than the case decided a half dozen years ago. Uh, it was one of the cases argued, it was argued by phone on May 4th and we would expect the decision sometime between now and the end of June. Um, anybody want to weigh in on that one? If not, I'll mention one other. Uh, no immediate thoughts about that one, but there's another uh, First Amendment case that had been decided already. Uh, yes. Court, but actually ended up with no, no First Amendment grounds. Exactly. And that was United States versus Sending Smith, which the Ninth Circuit had held that the Immigration and Nationality Act conditions on encouraging people to remain in the country in violation of law uh, was, uh, was unconstitutional. Uh, I listened to the argument uh, in that case and I've been uh, following that case fairly closely. And it appeared at argument that uh, the court was interested in actually deciding the case on the issues. As I say, the Ninth Circuit had held that that condition was unconstitutional. Um, and the court ended up saying, essentially, the Ninth Circuit should not have reached out to decide that issue, that it hadn't been briefed by the parties. Uh, it was one that the court, sua sponte, on its own, had decided to inject into the case and ask uh, for further briefing on. Uh, and so it simply uh, sent it back to uh, have the case decided on its original ground, uh, on the arguments that had been made by the parties. Um, and it's one of those anticlimactic moments when you see a, a case where you have a strong circuit court opinion affirming First Amendment rights, and you have either the threat that the Supreme Court is going to overturn that strong ruling and make some bad law or uh, reaffirm it in a way that's helpful, and then to have this end up with a, essentially a do-over, send it back and, and uh, have it decided on some narrower grounds. Um, it's interesting that the court uh, would do that. And the other interesting part of it uh, is that the opinion, and a very strong opinion, uh, was from Justice Ginsburg. And no real sense why they seem to shift gears from reaching the First Amendment question in the oral argument to, right. to deciding to blow it off in the opinion. Exactly, because the court was fully engaged in the argument uh, and uh, not a strong indication that they were looking to duck the issue, but I suspect that as they were trying to decide it, they couldn't reach some consensus on the merits and look for a way to uh, simply send it back. And the other Supreme Court case that's wait awaiting decision um, is the, uh, Barr versus the American Association of Political Consultants, uh, argued uh, again in a phone conference call on uh, May 6th, 
Um, this involves the, the robocalls. This is the Telephone Consumer Protection Act of 1991. That's the law that's supposed to um, keep you from getting a ton of robocalls on your cell phone. Um, the, um, in 2015, uh, an exception was created to the law to allow robocalls to try to collect uh, government-backed debts. And so the American Association of Political Consultants says essentially this has now become a content-based distinction where we're allowing robocalls based on the content of some robocalls and we're disallowing robocalls based on the content of others. And that violates the First Amendment's prohibition on content discrimination. Um, they also won in the lower court, they won in the Fourth Circuit. Uh, and so again, it's the Justice Department that appealed to the Supreme Court. Uh, and, and we would expect a decision on whether there's a First Amendment violation here sometime between now and the end of June. It's a little tricky because the, it, at the oral argument, it basically uh, divided, the, the, the court itself and the lawyers seemed divided over whether they were actually challenging just the constitutionality of the exception for debt collection calls or whether that exception meant that they were challenging the constitutionality of the entire statute because it rendered the entire robocalls law content-based. Uh, and I think that's part of what the court will have to sort out between now and June in, in figuring out what they're going to decide. Right. One of the interesting things about the, interest, the original law, the uh, TCPA, is that it's always had issues with uh, discriminating between different types of, of speakers and different types of calls. It has survived um, challenges up to this point, but the distinction for uh, government uh, debt collection calls was not part of the original law. It was one that Congress added at a later time. And that led to uh, this argument that it had made the law content-based. So the question that came up at oral argument, as you mentioned, is whether or not that inv invalidates the entire law or whether or not that added content discrimination uh, can simply be severed from the rest of the law and have the, the rest of the TCPA survive. And I, I'd say not clear from the oral argument whether they would lean toward thinking it is severable or, or I, I'm sure they don't want to strike down the whole law, but, but whether they will decide that they can or not, I think uh, sever it, I think remains to be seen. Yes. All right, thank you everybody. I'm gonna to turn to questions and answers. Um, there are about a dozen of them um and let's see what we can do uh the first one i see when a court weighs say california's total ban on protests can it look at the fact that the protests have not been observing social distancing in determining that the total ban meets the least restrictive means analysis anybody lada is that you want to take a crack or anybody else well um, that is interesting. I mean, the federal judge who did upheld hold the ban just, I think it, at this point, it's like it's a, an emergency situation and deference was given to, to California's judgment on this. But I don't think they got into um, the practical considerations of whether people are actually um, obeying social distancing requirements. But to me, and please somebody contradict me if I'm wrong, it seems like that would be it, it seems like that would be strange to say that like, well, just we don't think anybody's actually gonna adhere to this. So this is the least restrictive means that we have, right? Like before that, um, just to, to assume that there's no possible way to protest with social distancing, unless that's, unless that's actually factual and not just um, in most situations, people might not adhere to those guidelines. Am I right? I think so. I, you know, I, I think, you know, even if you can uh, base a sort of a blanket ban on an observation that people in the past haven't observed social distancing, uh, 
to say that future protests wouldn't uh, is basically the definition of a prior restraint. Uh, and so again, I think these things come up and ultimately will be decided case by case, but simply blanket pronouncements um, are start out with difficulties. All right, uh, the next one, um, government bans on congregating that might have been defensible at first. Is there a point at which um, they may become indefensible? Uh, for example, some of the bans when they were announced um, were said to be justified as necessary until the curve was flattened. But then once the curve was flattened, um, they became a moving target. The bands were extended until there's a vaccine available or until some other measure um, may be met in, in, in the indefinite future. Is there a way to deal with that kind of moving target nature of things? I mean, one of the things that uh that we said when the bans started going into effect um, a couple months ago was that they might be constitutional today, but as circumstances mm -hmm. change, something that's constitutional today could be unconstitutional a few weeks from now, from now when the situation changes. I don't necessarily think changing the target, basically changing, like there are, there are states that uh, had deadlines for their bans and they've renewed them and changing the target for the ban or the, the target date for ending the ban isn't in and of itself unconstitutional, but it is something where that analysis we talk about, the least restrictive means, like mm -hmm. is it the least restrictive way to achieve this compelling purpose? That analysis changes every time the circumstances change. All right, thanks. Um, the, uh, my, my friend and, and colleague who uh, is co-chair of our uh, Religious Freedom Committee in the section of Civil Rights and Social Justice. Um, Richard Fulton um, is asking, says, it strikes me that there's a problem with the state getting into the business of deciding that First Amendment protected activity is ever non-essential as compared to essential. That's certainly the case for religious freedom issues um, shouldn't the matter be resolved by looking at comparable permitted activity and regulating the First Amendment activity the same way? Any, any thoughts on that? Well, I certainly agree with the premise that he lays out that uh, putting the government in charge of deciding what is essential or then if you're permitting some expressive activities and not others, uh, and saying they're non-essential, uh, you automatically have, have a problem. I mean, you can certainly hypothesize circumstances where some types of um, uh, First Amendment related activities are uh, uh, less problematic than others. So for example, if you have an outdoor arena where there's um, a space for social distancing to hold the religious service in that space, um, it might be more difficult for the government to come up with the justification for regulating that circumstance. On the other hand, if you have uh, missionaries going door to door, <laughs> um, you know, that is something I think could be more easily regulated. So again, a lot of it is or dep depends on the specific facts that you're talking about. Um, Lucy, a questioner notes that some local papers are being bought up by big companies like Gannett and wondering what you think. Uh, th this is, yeah, wow. You know, we started about two months ago, there were five major newspaper companies in the country. Um, there was Gannett, there was Gatehouse, there was the Alden, there was Alden, there was Tribune and McClatchy. I think by June 30th, we're going to possibly have two, or at least that's what Ken Doctor from uh, News Asar, uh, who's a, who analyzes the media industry, um, what he says is possible. McClatchy has just declared bankruptcy. Gannett and Gatehouse have merged into the new Gannett. Um, Alden is trying to take over Tribune, uh, but there is a, a deadline coming up there um, that they've agreed not to, um, Alden has agreed not to pursue that until June 30th. 
I think this summer we're going to see some more consolidations. Am I happy about that? Do I think this is a happy thing? Uh, no, of course not. Um, I think the more um, it, it, it's 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 terrible that these media companies are are basically being taken over by hedge funds. Uh, you can it, it's demonstrable that in some of these communities that have been taken over, um, they've they've lost a lot. Basically, people have come in and gutted the assets. They've sold the property. They've done all these things. On the other hand. In those towns right now, they still have a local news organization. So, uh, you know, I, I have I have friends who work in every single one of these companies, uh, the publicly traded ones and the privately uh, the private companies like Hearst. Uh, nobody's in in very good shape, but uh, you know they're they're still in there trying every day. Um, it's it's the smaller publications that are really in trouble, I think. And the, the um, communities are, are the, these regions of the country are in danger of becoming news deserts. And if you look at the map that Penny Abernathy publishes every once in a while um, of you know what we've lost, you could look through the middle of the country, North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, Kansas, going on down in there, in, that it's missing all the little dots. They basically, those news organizations have just disappeared. All right, um, a questioner um, says it's his understanding and I, I, my understanding that this is true that many of the government, federal government agencies are not processing FOIA requests. They're using the crisis as an opportunity to basically put FOIA requests on hold. Um, I know that lawyers are still filing them, um, but, but I think they are facing that challenge of no action. Does anybody else have any, any specific information to add to that? Not specifically um, related to FOIA, just because I haven't been working on FOIA cases during this time, but uh, my experience is that getting governments to put FOIA requests on hold has never been exactly a unique situation. Uh, but I can tell you from cases that I'm working on where the government is uh, the, the party um, that uh, they have been seeking and getting uh, very liberal extensions of time for doing routine filings uh, simply because of you know, the circumstances that's affecting everybody and it's mm -hmm. certain, uh, understandable, but I think to a certain extent as well, taking advantage of the situation. I would imagine, and I have no, I mean, I, I don't know this, but I would imagine that some of the agencies where you're asking for um, more sensitive information, um, who are always the most reluctant to give you information anyway, um, there, uh, I'm not sure you would want the FOIA processors processing a lot of those requests from their home computers. True. Um, I, I, I would think there would be some security concerns with a lot of that information. All right, um, this is one I don't know whether anybody has any specific information about. The questioner is asking, are any of you aware of the issues between the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, the Cheyenne River Indian Reservation, and the South Dakota governor? If so, any thoughts on her wanting to shut down the tribal checkpoints and her efforts in addressing this in, in Washington, DC, and her attempts to violate treaties? Um, I'm only aware of it because my my niece lives on just outside one of those checkpoints in Mobridge, South Dakota. Um, but the South Dakota governor is an interesting individual. Um, she uh, I don't know if if they've moved into DC if they've if they filed action or not. But I would think that this is something that um, the tribe probably has a lot of standing or a, 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 probably has a lot of law on their side. All right. Thank you, Lucy. Um, 
some of these, I apologize. There are some very good questions here that are not necessarily free speech and free, pre free press questions. I will try to pose them, um, but I'm not sure whether we have the expertise to answer them. Um, the questioner asks, what about the State Department? Um, my question just disappeared, hold on. Um, what about the State Department refusing to issue or renew passports? I haven't heard anyone talking about this, but that seems overly broad exercise of emergency powers. Anybody? Not, not an area I have any expertise in. I can tell you they basically shut down issuing visas in embassies across the country, across the world, I mean. I mean, they've shut um, the embassies. They've shut the embassies, and um, it would not be—it would not surprise me to find out that they're not doing it. Um, I mean, I'm sure that the president would assert his broad authority over immigration. Uh, whether that's justifiable or not, I don't know, but I'm sure that would be the government's the government's argument added to the emergency situation. Uh, who gets to decide what is or is not an emergency situation that warrants restricting constitutional rights? And are there means of reviewing such decisions? Um, I, you know, the president has emergency declaration powers and governors have emergency declaration powers. The president's under state laws, uh, under federal law, the government governors under state laws. I would think the nature of the state laws differ from state to state. They certainly are all reviewable in court, but that would mean you'd have to find a court that was open for business. Um, and courts generally would, I think, defer to chief executives on, on a lot of these issues. There are challenges, as, as we've said, to the, the scope of the California order. I think there are probably a half dozen states where the governor's emergency orders have been challenged. Um, uh, most of them upheld, but not all of them, I guess. Any, anybody else? All right, um, as the COVID-19 exigency of stay home orders undermine the rebuttable presumption that blanket bans are unconstitutional. Well, I, I think uh, we discussed this a little bit earlier that uh, blanket bans, uh, particularly if they're related to speech activities um, are going to be suspect and you're going to have to look at uh, uh, how they're applied in, in particular circumstances. Um, in terms of just freedom of movement generally, that's, you know, I think that's a, a different issue and I really can't really speak to that. And I'd say that um, in terms of the orders that we've seen, most of them aren't really blanket bans in the sense that they don't prohibit assembly. They prohibit assembly in groups uh, like larger than 10 or larger than whatever number the state has chosen. Um, and you know, also it's important for purposes of seeing whether something is constitutional if there are alternative means to, to do the activity. So the idea being we're not prohibiting people from worship. There's other ways you can do that, but we are prohibiting people from assembling in a group large, larger than this number. Right, and one, one point worth making is that even when you're in a non-emergency situation, the government does have some power over the size of groups. They can regulate mm -hmm. the time and manner of groups and the size of the group can determine how far uh, what kinds of regulations can be applied so when you put an overlay of an emergency situation and ask what is the limit of the government's power to prescribe that uh, that again would would be determined by uh, you know what kinds of regulations specifically the government is trying to enforce whether they're discriminating between different kinds of expression uh, what the size of the groups are, whether or not they're dependent on social distancing regulations and a host of other variables. Uh, a questioner asks, does the prospect of contact tracing by the government of people who participate in First Amendment activity that turns out to include infected people raise difficult First Amendment issues? Well, the first answer to that is yes. 
<laughs> well, I think that may be the only answer to that. I mean, well, yeah, it, you know, it, it, that happened actually in South Korea where they did, I mean, when they had their outbreak, like they did con control it fairly quickly, but part of that was that um, they had a system to trace basically every person and who they came in contact with. A lot of it involved um, the initial outbreak was traced to a particular South Korean church and they quickly just shut down um, all of the meetings of that church. And it's interesting to see that happen there, although they were able to control the spread fairly quickly, that's the kind of thing that I think makes a First Amendment advocate shudder or stay up at night. And that's, I mean, it does raise huge issues where you see uh, where contact tracing can be used in a, in a way that's excessive, in a way that penalizes certain forms of expression. Well, I have a young 30-year-old niece who's teaching English in South Korea, and we were Zooming the other night, and I said, how's it going, Emily? And she said, well, she explained the contact tracing. She said it shut it down really fast. She said, it feels like 1984. On the other hand, I'm not afraid to go out. It worked really well. I said, so what do you think? And she said, well, I guess I don't mind it so much. It came down to um, safety, but she, she was describing how fast that operation worked. Um, I'm gonna jump around a little bit. Um, I, my, again, my ABA friend, Bill Choik asks, does the faithless electors the two arguments that the court heard there, do those have First Amendment implications? Well, uh, I believe that the faithless electors, like the, in that case, you had um, the electors who did not vote for um, the candidate, voted for by the popular vote in their state, but uh, voted with their own consciences. And in the states involved, Washington and Colorado, I believe, both of those states have faithless elector laws that penalize electors for doing such a thing. And the argument that the electors brought was that these laws are unconstitutional because they impose a penalty on, on speech, on an elector voting their mind. Um, so it, 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 these are, they're both First Amendment cases brought on First Amendment grounds. Um, if I were to guess what would happen in them, I think that the, both states made the argument that if electors could uh, could vote with their conscience and that would sort of that could lead to sort of a chaotic thing where the, po uh, the actual votes no longer matter. Um, but to be honest, I think that the outcome of the case, um, if they do decide that uh, faithless elector laws are unconstitutional and violate the First Amendment, I think the outcome will just be that states will be incredibly careful about the electors they choose after that. Um, so I don't really think that there's gonna be a practical difference going forward, but it, these are first amendment cases. All right, my mistake for omitting them in my Supreme Court review. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, does anyone know what happened to the court hearings against Trump prior to the pandemic, specifically regarding the whistleblower? I do not. Mm. Anybody else? No. All right. Um, and this seems similar to the question about tracing, but maybe slightly different. Are there First Amendment implications with possible disclosure of people who might have come into contact with the coronavirus? Well, I suppose there could be First Amendment implications to anything depending on how it was used. Um, and more to the point, uh, privacy implications uh, mm -hmm. are separate from First Amendment issues. But uh, um, certainly whenever the government is gathering that kind of information because people have been together in groups, particularly if they're together in groups to do things like protest, um, uh, the, the restrictions, um, then how that information is used could be, uh, could raise significant problems. All right, and uh, a questioner is, I think, uh, adding to what we've said about the FOIA yeah. situation that, that uh, one of the issues may be that people are working from home and it's harder to process the 
-hmm. Freedom of Information Act requests, and then also more difficult to coordinate identification and collection of the materials uh, when working from home. And I right. thank you. Thanks for posting that. I think that's certainly all true. Yeah, I think that is. Um, but I guess I would reiterate what someone else already said, which is the government doesn't really need any more excuses to be slow about processing Freedom of Information Act requests. Um, I think that covers the questions um, and we could give everybody a minute for any closing thoughts. Um, if anybody has anything they wanna add. I just look forward to a time when the news isn't all about coronavirus and everything that's happening as a result of it. Um, Bob, why don't we give you a minute to say something about the book that you just finished? Oh, <laughs> well, um, I would be saying more about it if uh, there hadn't been this hiatus in everybody's lives. Um, and uh, it, uh, I finished writing it at the beginning of the year and it would be more further along into production uh, at this point if there hadn't been a delay. But uh, uh, I, I expect the publication will be early in 2021. It's uh, a book I'm calling the, um, the Mind of the Censor and the Eye of the Beholder, uh, The First Amendment and the Censor's Dilemma. Uh, it'll be published by Cambridge University Press, basically talking about uh, the nature of censors and censorship and focusing on various stories through our history, beginning with Anthony Comstock to the present day. Congratulations, Bob. I think look, forward to, look forward to reading it, Bob. I think it will be very, very useful and very uh, informative and congratulations on finishing it up. Now, hopefully it will be fun to read. That's the point. All right, well, I think um, if nobody has any closing comments, uh, we, we can set a record and say we actually finished early uh, and covered everything we wanted to cover. So um, I'm just gonna take a minute and thank the ABA section of Civil Rights and Social Justice for this um, free webinar. Um, our gratitude uh, to the panelists, this, by the way, um, I, I consider these panelists my friends, but they also are regulars in doing this and uh, are very generous with their time and insights um, uh, when we do put on these programs. So, so thank you all three of you very much for, for once again um, being available to do this. Um, you really make Thanks, a critical, critical contribution to, I think, are helping to promote understanding about free speech and free press issues. Uh, the section of civil rights and social justice, as we've said, provides a number of free web webinars. In fact, they really have been doing um, Herculean work over the last couple of months, uh, literally doing dozens of webinars on COVID-19 related issues, um, bringing in experts and advocates and commentators um, from all over the country uh, on a whole range of different subjects. Um, we hope this is helpful to people in their interests and in their work. Um, and uh, please, if you're not a member of the ABA, consider joining or becoming active in the ABA. Um, please consider joining the uh, section of Civil Rights and Social Justice at ambar.org uh, slash CRSJ. And um, if you'll forgive me, I will make a pitch and say we also could use help uh, in the form of gifts um, to the section um, for the work that we do in advancing human rights and civil rights and civil liberties. Um, you can donate at ambar.org slash donate CRSJ. Um, you can find more information about all of this on the CRSJ webpage. And with that, uh, let me thank the staff of the section, in particular, Ali Kilsgaard, um, who has been lurking for the past hour and a half, making sure that we didn't screw up and got everything right. Um, and other section staff that have been working so hard to keep things going during this period. Um, thank you, Lada. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you, Bob. And um, I, with that, I think we are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.